traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. Welcome to episode 17 of the Folklore Podcast. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. In my last member-only mini-episode of the Folklore Podcast, I talked about the serious representation, or lack of it, of folklore in the media. Before we begin today's interview, that is a subject that I want to return briefly to here in the main show because it's something in which you can spend just a few seconds of your time to help me to hopefully make a difference. In April, the United Kingdom hosts the British Podcast Awards, and you can vote for the Folklore Podcast in the Listener Choice category. Winning this award would be a massive achievement for the podcast and would really help to get it more widely noticed. There is no doubt that the rise in popularity of this show demonstrates how much interest there still is in folklore as a subject. Please, help me to show the mainstream media that it should pay more than just lip service to the subject that we love by voting for this show at the Podcast Awards. You don't have to be in the UK to do this. The British Podcast Awards title just means that the show must be made in the UK, which this is. So please, pause this podcast now and visit www.britishpodcastawards.com slash vote. Type The Folklore Podcast into the search box, select this show and submit your vote. If you have more than one email address, you can vote more than once and you won't be spammed. So please help me to make a difference now by voting for the Folklore Podcast. You can vote until the middle of April. I'll put a link on our website for this too. Thank you. And now, on with today's episode, which is a guest interview show. Today on the Folklore Podcast, I'm joined by Corinne Murray to discuss the subject of the ways that folklore in the real world is incorporated into various genres of fantasy fiction. Corin is a qualified language practitioner and received her MA in Afrikaans from the University of Johannesburg in 2014. In her dissertation, she studied the way in which Norse mythology is used in Afrikaans and Dutch literature. Most recently, she read a paper at the South African Society for Medieval and Renaissance Studies 2016 conference titled Cloaked Love. The Cloak as Representation of Unrequited Love, the Male Body and the Limits of the Female Role in Three Medieval Scandinavian Texts. And in 2012, she read a paper at the same conference, which was titled The Walking Dead of Froda, The Hauntings of Froda in the Erbigjar Saga and their link with both pagan and medieval Christian traditions. She has a keen interest in folklore, mythology and archaeology, as well as a love of fantasy and speculative literature. Not content with only reading speculative literature, she also writes mostly fantasy fiction, in which she makes use of mythological and folkloric elements. Corinne also has a weekly blog post in which she discusses folklore and mythology. Links to much of this can be found on Corinne's guest entry on our website, at www.thefolklorepodcast.com. Now, I extend my apologies for one or two slightly sticky moments in the Skype connection with Corin for this interview. 
A stable signal with South Africa proved to be quite difficult to maintain at times. But it is my aim to bring you interviews with fascinating researchers and academics from all around the globe. And some places are harder than others. Corin, welcome to the uh, Folklore Podcast. Could we start, please, by just um, getting a little bit of background on what it is that you do and how you use folklore and how you became interested in it? Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Um, by day, I'm a translator for a media company. Um, in my spare time, I write fantasy and that's actually where my interest in folklore and mythology came from. Um, there is so much use of folklore and myth in the fantasy genre that you can't really help but go back to the source material and read that and fall in love with it. Absolutely, yes, you're right. So, lo looking at it in broad terms, how does folklore inspire this genre of fiction, fantasy fiction, in the first place, do you think? Um, I think it's part of, it's kind of a stepping stone for the fantasy genre as a whole, and sometimes for science fiction as well. Um, it can also be seen as a fantasy fiction in some way on its own, but for the fantasy um, in itself, um, usually you'll see that whether it's superstition or folklore of any kind, it is seen as being real in the fantasy world instead of simply being a story that is being told by someone. Okay, so, so how then is this folklore used in different kinds of fantasy fiction? So the, there are two worlds, I guess. There's, there's the primary world and there's the secondary world within that fiction. So, so how is folklore interwoven into those different stories? Okay, you can see the real world, if I can call that our world, the real world, as the primary world and the fantasy world of the book, the secondary world. Um, epics, to a great or lesser degree, draws on the real world folklore and to colour the fantasy world, the secondary world. So you'll have like Lord of the Rings, Chronicles of Narnia, Wheel of Time, the Discworld books, and even Harry Potter, where they draw on the real world. Um, for instance, you'll have in Lord of the Rings, you'll have elves, which are drawn more from the Norse mythology type of elves than fairies and sprites, really. And in Harry Potter, there's an abundance of folklore that is used in the spells of the wizards, um, not to mention the world building itself, where mythological creatures are shown to be real. Um, in this world books, of course, Terry Pratchett is a complete genius, where he interweaves not only politics and satire from our own world, but then also uses the folklore and mythology of our world and creates his own world from that as a kind of mirror to our own world. Um, in Wheel of Time, you have at the right beginning of the books, you have a Maypole celebration, which, if I remember correctly, is even called a Maypole. So you can clearly see that when the book starts. So you also have a secondary world with secondary world folklore and myth, which Brandon Sanderson is quite good at doing. Uh, his Mistborn series, uh, he has created his own magic system called Allomancy, that is the main magic system of the books. But in his other books like Warbreaker, he also makes uh, use a lot of his own mythology and folklore that he creates for this world, for the planet, and his own cosmology. So he doesn't just draw on what is already there. You can also have a secondary world um, containing the primary world 
folklore in a way of songs. For instance, one of my favorite pieces is in Lord of the Rings, where Frodo sings what Tolkien says to be the full um, song or story of Hey Diddle Diddle, where it turns out to be this long song about how the cow comes to jump over the moon and is really shows not only sense of humor but also the way in which folklore which is already present in the primary world can be brought into the secondary world and be built upon and you can also have a changed primary world with primary world folklore and myth uh, especially in urban fantasy like jim butcher's dresden files and then also the harry potter universe uh, if I may go to the Afrikaans uh, literature, you have Skarpiun by Weynand Kutzer and Vater Bobbejaan by Ben Venter, which also makes use of a lot of folklore and mythology in the primary world, and it almost turns it into urban fantasy. So there really is, to use Tolkien's term, a sub-creation going on whether you create your own folklore or use existing folklore, you get to, f to build upon the primary world and the secondary world both. In another good example, um, if there's time. Of course. Um, from the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Prince Caspian, where the Norse mythology is used the, from the elder Ed of the Voluspa, where it is told that golden pieces, uh, play pieces from a game will be found in the grass. And in that book, Prince Caspian, one of the children actually finds a golden chess piece lying in the grass. And I just thought you don't have to know the Norse mythology to be able to um, enjoy that part of the story, but it just becomes much more richer when you know that mythology and then read the book and know that it almost shows a world reborn and suddenly you know where you are in the mythology of the world. Yes, absolutely. And, and you were talking there about um, J.K. Rowling and, and about Terry Pratchett, and they're yes. both yes. two people who are really, really good at this. I mean, Terry Pratchett... Um, had a lot of advice from Jacqueline Simpson, who is a very well-known UK folklorist. She's a, a colleague of mine at the Folklore Society. He worked yes. very closely with her to to bring this folkloric aspect of the world around us into his writing. Um, Joanne Rowling does exactly the same thing. But what they're doing is they're using existing folklore and they're weaving it into their stories. Is that always the case, or are there authors that that create whole new folklore worlds within their writing? There are authors, um, especially uh, one of the newer authors, and um, he's been writing for a few years, but he's quite prolific, is Brandon Sanderson. He is basically creating his own universe with different planets, and each planet has its own magic system not necessarily based on anything that is existing or that we know of as folklore but for this, he'll have the allomancy of his misborn series is mad a magic system based on the use of metals um which is was quite refreshing to read because you don't really see that in books at all where he moves away from the almost medieval idea of magic and almost uh, remakes the magic system to suit his own books. Um, the books start out in a certain time period and he builds on it as time goes by. He creates the characters from the first books become religious figures in later books. So he not only shows how the religion is created and how the law around them is created, 
but also shows how the world grows around this religion and law. And he does this in quite a lot of his books, uh, which is one reason why I love his books. <laughs> so how then, when authors are doing this, how are they taking the folklore or the legends of our world, the primary world, um, and how are they using that as a stepping stone to create this folklore? So how is our folklore forming a starting point for what they're creating? Um, if you look at something, if I can take from a TV series uh, from Stargate, which was actually my first um, really entrance to Egyptian mythology, believe it or not, mm -hmm. Uh, they used the Egyptian mythology with the science fiction to show a whole new mythology of the world. So aliens are real. They did come to Earth. They did build the pyramids. Um, you have the gods who are real, but they are alien. Um, in books, you have... In the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher, you have wizards that are real and walk the streets. You have vampires that are real. Um, the same with, for instance, Anne Rice's books, where vampires are real. So, for instance, you can take any piece of folklore, whether it's witches or gods or whatever, and in the secondary world, you make them as real as you want them to be and have them affect the world in a way that they would affect the real world um, if they were physically real. I hope that makes sense. Yes, it does indeed. <laughs> and actually, that leads me on to the next point um, quite interestingly because... You talk there about um, Stargate um, and about the Egyptian mythology um, and its links to alien life. And of course now we find that every time we turn on one of the um, documentary channels on our satellite or cable, we find shows like Ancient Aliens, which are using exactly this premise as, as a kind of pseudo-documentary <laughs> and saying, yes, actually, this is quite right, and these things were built by alien life. So what's happening there, I guess, is that this secondary world folklore is coming back into our world and becoming part of our mythology in reverse. Um, do you think that that happens a lot, that there's this bleeding back? Yes, I think that happens quite a bit and even without us really realizing it I mean for instance you have the suddenly um, headlines saying that they've discovered a real hobbit on an island <laughs> and you th and you think my goodness for that moment you go is it real <laughs> and you picture a real hobbit um, like you say, the ancient aliens, uh, I think there was a mermaid documentary like that as well. Yes, there was. It, um, but it does bleed back, especially within the fandoms. You find that it very much becomes a part of the real world. You not only get memes, but you get part of it used in everyday life. You get references to characters to things that have happened, um, especially with Harry Potter, I see a lot of people using some of the spells to get them out of work <laughs> and stuff like that, or wishing that, they, that it could get them out of work that day or out of school that day. So it, it does bleed back into our own world without us really realizing quite the impact that it has, especially at if it becomes so well known, I think um, thanks to the Lord of the Rings films and the Hobbit films, that that mythology has become a lot more part of our everyday life. 
And as a big Tolkien fan, at least now when I celebrate Hobbit Day, people know what Hobbits are and they still don't mind the cake. <laughs> and it's working, isn't it, in different ways there, I guess, because the the Mermaid documentary that you referred to, um, yes. that, that was a, a creative documentary. That was a piece of drama um, yes. which used actors but purported to be a documentary. So it's mm. drawing on yes. that folklore in that way. Whereas the Ancient Aliens documentaries, which are up to about season 800 now, or however many of them there are, they're not purporting to be anything else. They are saying this is a documentary. As far as we would like to say, this is the evidence to suggest that this is the case. So that's working in a slightly different way. And then again, of course, that Hobbit, real-life Hobbit article that you referenced was, I believe... Um, if I remember rightly, it was the remains of a some kind of small human, which they used the term Hobbit yes. to describe purely because of its Hobbit. size. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it's interesting, isn't it? There's lots of different ways that this is happening. It's happening in within fictitious documentaries. It's happening within actual documentaries, and then it happens as a means of description for something which is not folkloric or legendary at all but is a way of referencing it so that people will understand it in a newspaper headline yes um when i also think of uh, when they did the flybys of pluto as soon as you had the first photo someone made it into a death star <laughs> yes. uh, from star Wars. so <laughs> you immediately had people calling parts of it mordor or giving it other names from fantasy fiction. And it was, for me, really interesting. Maybe it's just the circles that I had out in that does that <laughs> kind of thing. But it was really interesting to see how fast people latch onto that idea of putting our folklore onto another planet, onto something else, to do our own sub-creation. Yes, and some of these things then become ingrained, don't they? Because people will understand that reference to a hobbit without necessarily ever having read any of Tolkien's literature. Yes, or even having seen the films, I think. Yes, yes, because it's just understood the, now. The yeah. titles, yes. Now, aside from these authors that you've already discussed, um, you also yourself write fantasy fiction so yes. how do you use folklore in your writing i mostly write a uh, high fantasy not really urban fantasy um so i mostly would i say use the primary world folklore and myth in a secondary world whatever that secondary world looks like so, for instance, in a story I'm busy with, I'm really focusing on the way in which the idea of the fates and the way of spinning the life thread and cutting the life thread is used and doing that, using it in my own story where that is actually real, where there are people who sit and spin and if they cut the thread it means that you die. So for my own stories, I like to read as widely as possible different cultures, folklore and mythology, and then take from that, that usually sparks an idea for me, for something that I can use in a story, that the story isn't the same as the myth which is told, but which I can build on and make my own. Yes, that was what I was going to ask you, is whether you draw on your own, you know, on Afrikaans folklore very strongly, or whether you use lots of different elements. I think a lot of different elements. Um, Afrikaans is actually very interesting because it's so stuck between so many worlds. So you have this... European heritage, which I think make it a lot easier for me to understand the references in the Discworld books. Then you have 
the Far Eastern Malay kind of influence, and you also have the African influence. So without maybe realizing it, I do use elements from African folklore to write my stories because I think that it is, for me, it is still part of my own folklore. Um, so, but I do try and read as much as I can. I find it extremely interesting to see how folklore differs around the world. Yes, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously as as people travel, they will take stories with them. So when they settle in other countries, those stories then take hold in another place. And of course, there were lots of that historically in, in far less happy times within the African area um yes, lots of people yes lots of people would have there would have been an influx and an outgoing of lots of people so do you find that when you look at other cultures that actually you're finding a lot of parallels with folklore that's closer to home there is quite a lot of parallels some of it i think is a lot older than i would imagine them to be uh this I mean, for instance, if you take the last few hundred years of globalization, there was so much movement around the earth, but I don't think stories just travel like that. If you look for a couple of thousand years, the stories have traveled around and have, and have had time to grow in different parts of the world. So you'll have Beowulf in England, where you have a Gaitish hero, and then you'll have um, Greta Saga in Iceland, which uses parts of the Beowulf story um, to show actually their hero's downfall. So, and I mean, that is about a thousand years ago. So, I think it's actually wonderful how the world changes and the stories change with it. And I think we shouldn't underestimate how fast that change happens or, in fact, how, also how slow it can happen. But I do find when I look at, for instance, um, voodoo, that I can still see elements of that in the Southern African folklore even, so that I can understand references that they make in it, which is fascinating when you think about it. Yes, absolutely it is. And um, it it's really these days, I guess, that we're, we're lucky that there is so much spread of folklore, but, but with technology being what it is now, of course, so it's so much easier for a lot of this stuff to get recorded and, and then subsequently be drawn on by people who are using it in this way. Uh, it used to be the case that we relied on people going out into the field and interviewing people, and of course we can, we can record it in a lot uh, more detail, a lot more easily these days. So I guess there's a wealth of stuff that can be drawn on by people now. Yes, uh, if I look in South Africa itself, you have people going out to the Khoi and the Sun and I mean, trying to save their languages, trying to save their culture and their stories from obliteration, really. So, and to, I mean, to be able to put that on the internet, to be able to say to people, look, this isn't just in some archive somewhere. You can listen to it, you can learn from it. it, is simply wonderful, especially for someone like me who isn't a folklorist per se, but who is very interested in folklore and mythology. Absolutely, and, and the kind of way that you use folklore and these other authors use folklore is still doing a vital service to the discipline because there is still, despite evidence to the contrary with universities closing down departments that study folklore and ethnology and these sorts of things, there is still a very wide public interest in folklore. Yes. 
So the fact that the data yes. is being used in this way and being used by fiction and fantasy authors and other people as well is what helps to keep this interest alive. So it's all really, really important. I'm glad to hear that, <laughs> but I think it is true. <laughs> um, like I said in the beginning, I, when you read these texts, um, you, it brings you back to the source texts, or the sources at least, if they aren't texts. Um, I don't think I would have discovered Beowulf if it wasn't for Lord of the Rings. Um, it's not really a text that is much read in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> My thanks to Corin for this look into the world of fantasy writing. Do visit her webpage and take a look at some of the ways in which she uses folklore in her own writing. The episode supplement for this show, which is free to patrons at any level on our Patreon page or available from the podcast website, lists all of the authors and titles which Corin referenced in this interview. Finally, my heartfelt thanks go to all of the wonderful supporters of this podcast on Patreon who enabled us to meet our first goal this month. Because of your generosity, we're currently building an online store for the podcast website, which will enable us to begin to release new editions of old folklore texts, video, audio products, and other items which you have told us that you would be interested in. Sales from the store will, I hope, enrich your study and enjoyment of folklore and, in return, enable the podcast to continue to grow and do even more with the material. There are some potential live event possibilities on the horizon and the next goal for patron support will be announced very soon, if it wasn't already by the time you listen to this. There will be one slight change next month for those that listen at the time of release. Because we are joining up with another big podcast in a crossover show, the episode on April the 1st will be the guest show, and the episode on April the 15th will be my discussion. Thanks for listening. See you next time. The Folklore Podcast is created and hosted by me, Mark Norman. Find out more about my writing and research at www.facebook.com slash Mark Norman Folklore. The Folklore Podcast Art Director is Melissa Martell. Find her work at www.mdmcreate.com. The Folklore Podcast will always be free to listen to, but it is an enormous amount of work to research, create, record and write two of these episodes every month. And so, we have created a simple way in which you can help to support the ongoing life of the Folklore Podcast. Please visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com and click on support. There are various ways that you can help, and they don't all involve giving us money. Even just leaving a simple review on iTunes or other podcast apps helps to grow our audience. So please do visit and take a moment to help us to keep going. Thank you for listening. The Folklore Podcast theme music is written and performed by Gurdy Bird.